Right, listen very carefully okay. to what I've got to say to you now. You were under arrest for the murder of Leslie Susan Molsey. You're joking. Between 12 noon on Sunday, the 5th of October 1975 and 06.45am on Wednesday the 8th of October 1975. October 8th, 1975, the body of a little girl is found by the side of a remote road. She's lying in the grass, face down in the mud. She has been subjected to a horrifying sexual assault and has been stabbed a shocking 12 times, with one of the stab wounds piercing her heart. What had started as a missing child investigation had now become a major murder inquiry. Little do people know at the time is that it will lead to one of the most appalling miscarriages of justice in British criminal history. At around lunchtime on October 5th, 1975, 11-year-old Leslie Molseed was asked to go to the shop by her mother. The family used a rotor to ensure that all children did chores, and children in the area were often trusted to run small errands for their parents. They lived on Delamere Road in Rochdale, Greater Manchester. 11-year-old Leslie lived with her mother April, Danny, her stepfather, and her two sisters. Life for Leslie, often called Lel, by her mother, hadn't always been easy. She had been born with a congenital cardiac condition, and an operation to correct this at the age of three had left her frail, with a reduced mental level for her age. She was told by her mother to go and buy some bread and air freshener from a nearby shop located on Ansdale Road, and in her blue raincoat, little Leslie set off. She was spotted walking on the secluded Steops Lane. Then, she vanished. When Leslie failed to return home quickly, April became concerned and sent her siblings out to see if they could find her, and Danny soon joined in the search too. The family looked everywhere they could think of, but Leslie couldn't be found, and there was no evidence that she had made it to the shops. At 3pm and with no trace of her anywhere, the family frantically contacted Rochdale Police. Investigators quickly mobilised and formed a search. They checked the town and local area, interviewing people and looking everywhere to try and find the vulnerable young girl. While the police were searching for Leslie, four girls aged 12, 13, 16 and 18 came forward to the police. They told officers that a man had exposed himself to them the day before Leslie had gone missing. With a missing child and these four girls now saying this, the police quickly pursued the lead. He was soon identified as 23-year-old Stefan Kishko. Stefan was a local tax clerk. His parents had emigrated to the UK from Eastern Europe following the end of the Second World War. Outside of his mother and aunt, he didn't have a social life. His father had suffered a heart attack five years before, and he had died at Stefan's feet. He also had learning difficulties, meaning he had the mental age of around 12 years old. Despite him never having been in trouble with the law, the police quickly determined that he was the man they were looking for. With his poor social skills, his odd habits including writing down registration plates of cars that annoyed him, and with the testimony of the four girls saying he had exposed himself, the police were determined to prove that he was their man. Just three days after Leslie had vanished, the worst fears of everyone were realised. Her little body was found by the side of a road. She had been brutally attacked and stabbed to death in a horrifying, frenzied attack. Her appalling death left the local community in shock. It made headlines around the country and left her family utterly devastated. On the 21st of December 1975, Stefan Kishko was arrested on suspicion of murder. He was intensely questioned with his story being picked apart by the police. After three days, he confessed. On Christmas Eve 1975, Stefan Kishko was charged with the murder of 11-year-old Leslie Molseed. Not long after, Stefan retracted his confession in the presence of a solicitor, but this made no difference. His trial began in Leeds in July of 1976, and Stefan's defence lawyer was David Waddington. David Waddington was a successful lawyer and member of the Queen's Council. Stefan again repeated that he hadn't killed Leslie and that his confession was false. When asked why he had admitted it, he replied, I started to tell these lies, and they seemed to please them, 
and the pressure was off as far as I was concerned. I thought if I admitted what I did to police, they would check out what I said, find it untrue, and would then let me go. On the 21st of July 1976, the jury returned after five and a half hours of deliberation. Stefan Kishko was found guilty by a 10 to 2 majority. The judge sentenced him to life in prison for the murder of Leslie Molseed. The girls who had come forward saying he had exposed himself were praised by the judge for their bravery and honesty in telling the court their story. The officers were also praised by the judge for their great skill in bringing to justice the person responsible for this dreadful crime, adding, I would like all the officers responsible for the result to be specially commended and these observations conveyed to the chief constable. The mother of one of the girls said that Stefan should have been arrested sooner and called for him to be hanged. She said, children are a lot safer now this monster has been put away. Kishko was soon transferred to Wakefield Prison. As he was now not only a convicted sex offender but a child killer, he had to be placed on a Rule 43 to protect him from other inmates. Three years later, Stefan launched an appeal, but this was dismissed. Lord Justice Bridge said, We can find no grounds whatsoever to condemn the jury's verdict of murder as in any way unsafe or unsatisfactory. The appeal is dismissed. While in prison, Stefan was attacked by fellow inmates. One of these incidents left him needing stitches. As his mental health started to deteriorate, he developed schizophrenia and began to suffer from delusions. His protestations of innocence were labelled as a symptom of his delusions. He was moved from prison to prison, but in 1991 he was admitted to Ashworth Hospital after six months of delay for treatment of his declining mental health. Stefan's mother Charlotte fought tirelessly to have the case reopened. She was adamant that he hadn't murdered Leslie Molseed and that he had confessed under duress. She took it to her local MP Cyril Smith, but he ignored her pleas for assistance in reopening Stefan's case. She was also stonewalled by Prime Minister James Callaghan and his successor, Margaret Thatcher. In 1984, she contacted the human rights organisation Justice, who examined miscarriages of justice, and in 1987, she was put in contact with solicitor Campbell Malone. Malone agreed to take on Stefan's case. He consulted with Philip Clegg, who had served as junior defence counsel under Waddington in Stefan's original trial. Clegg had expressed the doubts he had at the time about Stefan's confession and subsequent conviction, and the pair worked together for the next two years on a petition for the Home Secretary. The final draft was ready to send to the Home Secretary on the 26th of October 1989. Coincidentally, that same day, David Waddington was appointed to that very position. He would resign in 1990 in order to take up peerage and become leader of the House of Lords. He was replaced by Kenneth Baker. It would be 16 months before a police investigation into the trial would begin. In February 1991, after receiving help from a private detective named Peter Jackson, Malone finally convinced the Home Secretary that the case must be reopened. It was then sent to West Yorkshire Police, headed by Detective Superintendent Trevor Wilkinson. This would set in motion an extraordinary chain of events that would blow the case wide open. The police soon discovered that Stefan hadn't been asked if he wanted a lawyer, although during that time suspects didn't have the right to have a solicitor present. He had asked for his mother Charlotte to be there, but this was refused despite his learning difficulties. Crucially, the police didn't caution him until long after they had decided he was the man they were looking for. The semen found on Leslie's body was also re-examined. Wilkinson found that Stefan was infertile and incapable of producing semen, meaning the sample found on Leslie's body physically could not have come from him. It soon became apparent that they were now dealing with one of the most grave miscarriages of justice the United Kingdom had ever seen. Not only was Stefan Kishko an innocent man who had been in prison since 1976, this also meant that whoever had killed Leslie was still at large. The evidence of the semen had been suppressed by the police and never disclosed to either the defence team nor the jury. They also found that a witness had seen Stefan visiting the grave of his father on the day Leslie had been murdered, and the witness couldn't understand why they hadn't been called to testify. The errors in the investigation just kept on coming. A few months before the murder, Stefan had broken his ankle, 
This, coupled with the fact he was overweight, meant it would have been incredibly difficult for him to scale the slope where Leslie had been found. This evidence was also not shown to the court. The catalogue of errors made by his legal counsel were also in the firing line, when it became apparent how badly they had handled his defence. On the first morning of the trial, the Crown delivered thousands of pages of additional unused material. This is where the defence counsel made a huge mistake. They didn't ask for an adjournment to examine them. Instead, they let the trial continue. They used the defence of diminished responsibility, a defence that Stefan hadn't agreed to. They said that he had murdered Leslie after receiving testosterone to treat hypogonadism, and this might have made him behave strangely. The endocrinologist who was treating Stefan vehemently disagreed with this argument, saying the treatment would not have led to that kind of behaviour, much less make him inclined to kill. His endocrinologist was never called to testify to this effect. The four girls who said that Stefan had exposed himself to them were now aged 27, 28, 31 and 33. They also had something to say. They admitted they had made up the allegation against Stefan and that he hadn't committed indecent exposure. They said they had done it for a laugh and that, at the time, it was funny. One of them was interviewed by police on Valentine's Day 1991. She said she wished she hadn't said anything and that she didn't think at the time it would go that far. She said she had gone along with what one of the other girls had said. Another one of the girls said they had seen someone urinating in public, but it wasn't Stefan. She also refused to apologise. One of them was a friend of Leslie's older sister and she expressed the most remorse. She hadn't been called to testify along with the other three, but said that if she had, she would have told the truth and not committed perjury like the others had. Two of the girls received a formal caution by police for the criminal offence they had committed. In August 1991, the new findings were presented to the Home Secretary Kenneth Baker. He immediately handed it over to the Court of Appeal. The judicial investigation began on February 17, 1992. After hearing the plethora of new evidence that proved the wrong man had been convicted, Lord Chief Justice Lane said, It has been shown that this man cannot produce sperm. This man, consequently, cannot have been the murderer. And with that, Stefan Kishko was declared an innocent man, and his immediate release from custody was demanded. Anthony Beaumont Dark, a Conservative MP, said, This must be the worst miscarriage of justice of all time. It brings shame on everyone involved in the case. This brought fresh heartbreak for the family of Leslie Molseed. Not only did they now have to contend with the fact that an innocent man had gone to prison, but that Leslie's murderer was still out there. During the original trial, they had demanded that Stefan be publicly hanged, and Leslie's father, Frederick Anderson, had shouted a torrent of abuse at Charlotte Kishko after her son had been convicted. After Stefan was proven innocent, the Molseed family publicly apologised for what they had said. Lord Lane himself, Ronald Outeridge, the forensic scientist who had worked on the case, and the prosecution barrister Peter Taylor all offered no apology, nor did any of them express any words of remorse or regret for what had happened. The original trial judge, Hugh Park, said that while he was sorry for what had happened to Stefan, he was not sorry for how he had handled the trial. The police admitted that they had been wrong, but tried to justify the action taken in 1975. All David Waddington said was that had all the evidence been available to him in 1976, the case would have taken a different course. Stefan required further psychiatric treatment until April 1992. He was then released. He had spent more than 16 years in custody. The hunt was now on to find the real killer of Leslie Molseed. The first problem was that in 1985, when with Stefan in prison and the case being closed, the clothes belonging to Leslie that had been taken from the crime scene had been destroyed. Fortunately, the strips used to remove fibres from Leslie's clothes had been kept. In 1997, a former detective wrote a book about the murder of Leslie Molseed and named Raymond Hewlett as the man who had most likely taken her life. Hewlett had served with the Scots Guards before becoming a fairground worker. It was after this that he committed a string of appalling sexual assaults. He was sent to prison in 1972 after using paint thinner on a cloth to incapacitate a 12-year-old girl before attacking her on the moors close to his home in Todmorden. Fortunately, she was able to escape. Just six years later, another girl was attacked after he pointed a gun at her back, but thankfully she too was able to get away. 
he was sentenced to four years in prison for that offence. Despite two stints in prison in 1988, he committed another attack against a newspaper delivery girl and he was jailed once again. After this came to light, the family of Leslie Molsey had campaigned in Todmorden where he'd lived. They gave out flyers and demanded justice for Leslie. The samples from Leslie's clothes were sent to the Forensic Services Lab in Weatherby, West Yorkshire. After tests, they were able to extract a profile. And finally, in 1999, they had the full DNA profile of Leslie Molsey's killer. But he wasn't on the National DNA Database. In 2003, DNA profiling was introduced and this meant the police could check Hewlett's DNA against that of the samples from the crime scene. It came back as no match. The DNA wasn't Raymond Hewlett's. The police were back at square one. Alongside Raymond Hewlett, another suspect who was soon ruled out was Michael Horgan, who also had a criminal record involving horrific child abuse. In 2001, the News of the World newspaper ran an article saying that they had discovered evidence that Raymond Hewlett, Michael Horgan, a third man, were potentially involved in Leslie's death. This was prior to the DNA profiling result. They alleged that Horgan had groomed Leslie in the weeks leading up to her being murdered. This, like all the other stories, would go nowhere, as despite their horrendous criminal convictions, the men had nothing to do with the death of Leslie Molseed. It is worth noting that following a lengthy inquiry known as the Leveson Inquiry into the culture, tactics and ethics of the British press, the News of the World newspaper was shut down in 2011 after a plethora of journalistic malpractice and phone hacking scandals were uncovered. In November 2006, the news came that people had waited more than 30 years to hear. The police had arrested a man after having a direct hit with the DNA taken from the scene. The suspect had provided a DNA sample after being arrested in connection with another sex attack the previous year. And while he wasn't charged with that offence, when they had run it through the DNA database, it came back as a direct match to a sample found on Leslie's body. The suspect was named as 53-year-old Ronald Castry. I have no knowledge, but I've certainly never, never met this dead girl or any member of her family. <laughs> I have no knowledge as to how you, you come to say a sample of my DNA is found at that place, especially after 30 years. Castro was originally from the Turfell estate in Rochdale and had worked as a taxi driver before becoming a comic book dealer. His dreadful reputation preceded him. He was heavily disliked by his neighbours who said he had an extremely nasty temper. He had an abusive relationship with his wife and the marriage had ended in divorce in 1997. They shared two children and two weeks before Leslie had been murdered, his wife had given birth to a baby that wasn't his. On the day of the murder she had gone back into hospital, leaving him alone at home. When the police looked into Castry's background, they found a disturbing history of convictions. In 1973 he abducted and sexually assaulted a nine-year-old girl. He was charged £50 for the offences of incitement to commit gross indecency and indecent assault. Three years later, he was convicted again of indecently assaulting a seven-year-old boy. He was told to pay a fine of £50. Ronald Castry was subsequently charged with the murder of Leslie Molseed. He appeared in court on the 7th of November 2006 and was remanded in custody. In April the following year, Castry entered his plea, not guilty. He was refused bail and sent back to prison to await his trial. During the trial, Dr Gemma Escott told the jury that the chances of the semen coming from anyone other than Ronald Castry was more than one in a billion. The court heard how Castry had abducted Leslie from the street near her home. He then drove her to Rishworth Moor, sexually assaulted her, then stabbed her to death in a frenzied, brutal and savage attack, before leaving her body at the side of the road. On the 12th of November 2007, the verdict was returned. Ronald Castro was found guilty of the murder of Leslie Molseed. He was sentenced to life in prison with a minimum tariff of 30 years, meaning before he can even apply for parole, it will be 2036 and he will be 83 years old. Years of uncertainty and a long wait for justice have finally come to an end for the family of Leslie Molseed. We are relieved that after so long, our quest for justice for Leslie is now over. 
It has been a long and harrowing ordeal, and our gratitude to the friends, family, and strangers throughout the world who have given us their support is immense. This is a proud day for West Yorkshire Police too. We could never turn the clock back, but what we could do was try and put things right. And I'm proud to have led an excellent team of detectives who've done that today and achieved justice, brought Leslie's killer to justice. There was plenty of emotion in the courtroom behind me this afternoon, but after all, this was the conclusion of a case that's taken more than three decades to solve. The fallout from the case of Leslie Molseed was both unprecedented and immeasurable. Leslie's family had to go through the trauma of two murder trials, as well as the difficult realisation that the man who had murdered their beloved Leslie had been walking free for so long. Tragically, in 2014, Leslie's mother April died at the age of 74. In 1994, the surviving senior officer who had worked the original case, Detective Superintendent Dick Holland, as well as the forensic scientist who had worked the case too, Ronald Outeridge, were formally charged with doing acts tending to pervert the course of justice by allegedly suppressing evidence that proves Stefan's innocence, including the scientific tests done on the semen. In May the following year, the case was challenged by defence barristers who argued that the passage of time had made a fair trial impossible and that the case was an abusive process. The presiding magistrate agreed and the case was not put to a jury. Dick Holland had also served as an officer in the case of Judith Ward, who was accused of committing an IRA bomb attack in 1974. Her conviction would later be declared unsafe and she was freed after 17 years in prison. Like Stefan, her case was considered to be one of the most egregious miscarriages of justice in British criminal history. Holland retired from the force in 1988 and died at the age of 74 in 2007. After Stefan had been released, he was left a physically and emotionally broken man. He became a virtual recluse and showed little interest in anything. When people would approach him to apologise or offer support or encouragement, it would often frighten him. Upon his release, Stefan was promised £500,000 in compensation for his time in prison. He received an interim payment, but never the full amount. As on the 23rd of December 1993, Less than two years after being released from prison, Stefan Kishko suffered a massive heart attack and died at the age of 41. Four months later, his mother Charlotte, who had fought tirelessly for her son, died at the age of 70. The pair are buried together in Rochdale Cemetery. While in prison, Stefan wrote to a family friend saying, I am in prison for a crime I have not committed. I am missing my mother very much. I hope there will be a happy ending. In 1992, following Stefan's release, the two families who had been torn apart by the murder of Leslie, the Molseeds and the Kishkos, met in person to begin the healing process. Leslie's father, Frederick Anderson, said, I wasn't sure whether she would accept me into her home. I said some horrible things about Charlotte at the trial, for which I cannot apologise enough. Charlotte Kishko harboured no ill will towards the family, saying, I never blame the family for what happened to Stefan. I have got my son back, but that little girl can never be replaced.